what's going on everybody welcome to rec nation and listen we have a good recommendation from a good friend of the channel arthur elliott yes we are doing battle 360 this is a series and if you guys are here for it i don't mind watching this stuff with you yes i just changed the lighting because it's more suiting right right has to be red anyway guys let's dive into this this is call to duty this is from the history channel <clears throat> let's see let's see i don't know if this goes up it's a 55 minute almost 56 minute video hope you guys are there for it hope you're there to learn with me because world war ii as i get older fascinates me i don't know what it is but i've you know i don't think i've bought a a world war ii book per se i've just absorbed them as i get older I have some upstairs in, in my library and or in, on my bookshelf. Hold on. Let's pump the brakes on my bookshelf. Not my, I have an extensive library. No, no, no. I have this. So many books, leather bound books. No, guys. So listen, it, this is a topic that fascinates me. I feel like there are a lot of uh, technological like feats accomplished, not just engineering or mainly engineering, but also battle tactics that were formulated in World War II that, that still kind of have a presence in today's military and and the way we think today. You know, even though I feel like the war the battle the battle lines are all changed and it's very unique. But anyway, let me not dive down that rabbit hole. Let's this is about Battle 360. This is episode one, Call to Duty. Let's do this thing, guys strap in settle in this is going to be a long one i'm going to grab a drink real quick not sponsored but hey any of you guys in the u.s we do have our own areas in the nation blend coffee reach out i will try to get you the link i'll pin the link in the comments we are not i'm not going to be over commercialized but it is something that i am trying to push they put my our name on their coffee so i will be pushing their coffee come on all right without further ado let's dive in all right ready three two one let's go <laughs> i will try not to pause too much but i will be pausing all right so USS Enterprise, AKA the Big E, a fighting city of steel. She is the most revered decorated ship of World War II. On this 360 degree battlefield, where threats loom on the seas, in the skies, in the ocean depths. The Enterprise's enemies could be anywhere. And everywhere. Now, follow this sea-bound band of brothers through four years of hell. From Pearl Harbor to the doorstep of Japan. You know, you did this to us, watch this. Here we come now. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around you. Battle 360, USS Enterprise, call to duty. This series is brought to you with limited commercials by the men and women of Enterprise Rent-A-Car. The Central Pacific, February 1st, 1942. Aircraft carrier USS Enterprise, with 2,800 men aboard, steams through hostile waters near the Marshall Islands. War on the high seas has been raging for almost two months. Tensions on board run high. 1.40 p.m., two miles off the carrier's starboard bow. Five twin-engine Japanese bombers break out of the clouds and swoop toward Enterprise in a low glide. They're Mitsubishi G4Ms, allied codename Betty. Enterprise. 
Enterprise's anti-aircraft guns greet the invaders with a cloud of lead. But even with the carrier guns banging away, the Japanese Bettys are still determined to deliver their 132-pound high explosives onto Enterprise's deck. Just one hit could put this floating airfield out of commission. The Japanese planes open their bomb bay doors and let the ordnance fly. All the bombs miss. Man, <laughs> what all the bombs missed, bro. I would be oh that's a brown pants moment like if you're gonna if you're gonna try to take out a a carrier man you got to make sure you you deliver that first punch all the time there is no room for error you don't get a second try man but one is close enough to rock the enterprise shrapnel rains down on the carrier's deck mortally wounding one of her men with their bomb bays empty the enemy planes bug out, except the one in the rear. Although American gunfire has left her critically wounded, the last bomber does a 180 degree left turn and buzzes back toward the carrier. He knew it lost and he was going down, so he's going to take some of us with him. Enterprise Captain George Murray orders instant evasive action. Full right rudder. As the ship attempts to swing to the right, out from under the bomber, the enemy plane dips down to just a couple hundred feet above the water. All of our guns that could were firing at it, but it was coming on and kept coming and coming. Aviation machinist mate Bruno Peter Guido sees the impending disaster and scrambles into action. This sailor actually ran across the flight deck, jumped into a parked airplane, got on one of the machine guns from the plane. And he took the guns up like this, and he started shooting at them like this. With the ship moving sideways, at the last moment, a suicidal enemy bomber charts a flight plan for maximum destruction. He banks sharply to the right on a collision course with the Enterprise. bomber crosses over the deck. Its right wing shears off the tail section of Guido's plane. But the intrepid machinist's mate is unhurt and still firing as the enemy plane skids off the carrier deck. And the gunner took the plane around, shot him in the other time until it hit the ocean. That is, what, oh man, that is main character energy, bro. We gotta do something. Fucking get on the airplane's gun. Wow. You know what, why didn't, did they already have uh, planes in the air? Why didn't they scramble their planes? I, I don't know, but hopefully they'll cover that because that's interesting. Usually when radar picks up enemy planes, Planes are, are, are in the air already, but all right. It is clear to his shipmates that Guido's heroics have saved the day. His That's quick awesome. action spared the carrier a devastating blow. Hero man. The commanding officer of the aircraft carrier group, Rear Admiral William F. Halsey, has watched the extraordinary shootout from the Enterprise Bridge. Ten minutes after that was over, Halsey called down and said, who was that guy in the rear seat of that airplane who fired at the attacking plane? And he said, send him up to the bridge. From Guido's description, he stood at attention, saluted the Admiral and says, what is your name? And he said, Bruno Guido. What rate are you, Bruno? Aviation machinist made third class. They said, Bruno, you are now aviation machinist made first class.
enterprise as sailors, it's just another day on the job. One of many close calls they, and the most revered aircraft carrier in history, will face over the coming four years. Now these guys on the Enterprise had a 360 degree view of the entire war. We've got a surface threat. We've got an air threat. We've got a subsurface threat. So it's all around you, above and below you, was their battle space. A ship earns one battle star for every major battle she fights. By the end of the war in the Pacific, the Big E will earn 20 of them. Three more than any other ship, and seven more than any other carrier. And the nickname? Lucky E. Love that's crazy. That's, like, that's absolutely crazy that this aircraft carrier, one of our, like, I would say the U.S.'s most prized possessions, was just knee-deep in, in the mud of war, just straight up duking it out. That's awesome. Well, the people call the Enterprise the Lucky E, but I don't think she was so lucky as <laughs> she was good. The story of the Enterprise began six years earlier. Launched in 1936, USS Enterprise, alphanumeric designation CV-6, is a new breed of aircraft carrier. Yorktown class, the supercarrier of its era. It's a sleek hulled, medium weight vessel, 108 feet wide, with a flight deck running across almost the full 809 feet of her length. Her deck is Washington State timber. Her hull, Pennsylvania steel. Displacing 25,000 tons when fully loaded, the Enterprise has a range of 12,000 miles with a top speed of 32 and a half knots. She's armed with 24 50 caliber machine guns, four quad 1.1 inch cannons, and eight five inch guns that can take out air or surface targets from a maximum distance of 18,200 yards. The Big E weighs more than 16,000 tons less than the older carriers in the fleet but can carry the same number of warplanes into battle. She's more fuel efficient, more agile, more deadly. So it's like a, a, a destroyer that can carry airplanes, right? That's nuts. That it can carry the same amount of planes that, the, that its bigger brothers can. You know, that's... I, I, I know nothing about boats. I'm not the boat guy. So I don't know about like how crazy the displacement is. Is that like something? I, I, I don't know all that stuff. You know, when you compare water displacement, is that just how heavy, how big this machine is that they're comparing? I'm not, I'm not too sure. So please enlighten me in the comments, guys. The Enterprise had a spirit about it. Indomitability. No other ship was going to compare with it. The Enterprise can carry up to 96 aircraft. It is an armed airport. You have all of those workshops and areas underneath the flight deck, called the hangar deck, where they service the planes and where the planes are usually stowed. There are three elevators, and that's how those planes are brought up to the flight deck or taken below. Carrier is the floating base for one squadron of TBD Devastator torpedo bombers, the slowest aircraft, which are typically held back until enemy surface ships have been spotted. One squadron of Grumman F4F Wildcat fighter planes patrols near the ship, guarding it from air attack. And two squadrons of SBD Dauntless Scout bombers are routinely deployed to search 200 square mile sectors in all directions for an enemy presence. So these are the planes they carry, the type of planes they carry on board. So there's different designations for the different squadrons. That uh, The fact that we're just talking about, hey, these all are on the ship is absolutely insane. If the enemy is located, the SBD with a two-man crew and a max speed of 250 miles per hour 
can win an air-to-air -air shootout with the two 50 caliber machine guns in its nose and dual rear-mounted 30 caliber free-floating machine guns. It also has the capability of hitting enemy ships with 1,200 pounds of bombs. With its cadre of warplanes, Enterprise is well equipped for battle with Japan. But none of the Big E's pilots have ever fired a shot in anger. How will they respond when the Empire of the Sun delivers its first attack? with Japan is imminent. And while USS Enterprise is the supercarrier of her era, she won't be fighting alone. Was that a strategy by enemy aircraft? Like, if you were to get into the thick of it, right? Were, are you trained to fly in between the boats so that way hopefully their fire, like, <laughs> morphs into friendly fire when they're shooting their other... like. That's in the heat of battle, in the confusion of battle, you know, where no plan exists, uh, first contact. I, I, I feel like that's a very valid strategy, is to lead the gunners into another ship. Like, that's... Anyway. That's... At sea, the carrier is like the quarterback of a football team. She's defended by cruisers and destroyers on the surface of the water around her. By scout planes, bombers, and fighter planes launched from her deck and patrolling the skies overhead. And sometimes, even by submarines beneath the waves out in front. The escort ships that sail closest to the carrier are the destroyers. A destroyer is a relatively small warship, typically with a displacement of about 2,200 tons, a length of some 400 feet, and a width of about 40 feet. Like Enterprise, a destroyer's largest guns are her dual-purpose five-inchers, capable of firing five-inch projectiles at either surface or air targets. When taking on airplanes, these guns don't go for a direct hit. They send up a barrage of shells, known as flak, which are fused to explode at a specific altitude hopefully taking out any aircraft that are approaching the fleet. The explosions send out blasts of shrapnel that leave behind those distinctive puffs of black smoke. Okay. So, I mean, I kind of knew what, uh, like, a flat cannon was. So it's like you, um, it's like sending up a grenade. It's like you shoot it up there and it just blows up. And the, and the shrapnel from the explosion is what covers the area. Now you know. Now you fucking know. Wow. Destroyers were the last line of defense before the Japanese could get to the carriers. Larger gunships, called cruisers, are typically more distant from the carrier to serve as her first line of defense. Their primary mission is to protect that carrier at all costs. Everything else is secondary. It was a team effort. U.S. submarines also occasionally lend the carrier a hand. They're the eyes and the ears of that whole fleet. They can virtually be undetected. They're great for reconnaissance. And they can sink ships before they even know that they're there. But Enterprise is the heartbeat of the task force. It takes thousands of men to keep this floating city on the move. Clerks. Yeoman, cooks, men in the anti-aircraft divisions, radar men, radio men, signal men, different types of technicians. The ship typically has a marine detachment, and their job is security for the ship, and they generally have battle stations. There are a lot of people on an aircraft carrier, and all of them are doing different jobs. The average age aboard ship is 19 years old. And these young men have come from all across the country to serve on this massive melting pot. The decks echo with the accents of the Deep South and the Midwest. Ranch hands from Texas bunking with street toughs from Hell's Kitchen. Guys from Pennsylvania, Alabama, 
California and everywhere in between. For many of these American boys, life aboard this mega ship takes some getting used to. I grew up in Round Rock, and there's 1,200 people in Round Rock when I left there. Went aboard the Enterprise, and there's about 2,800 on the Enterprise. It's like a city. You didn't know all of them. The Enterprise was the biggest ship I'd ever seen in my life. In fact, when I walked up the gangplank for the first time, I was imagining, golly, there must be a swimming pool on here. In 1941, the crew was still a largely unproven group of sailors and marines. How they would respond in the heat of battle was anybody's guess. Being afraid carries a lot of baggage with it. I was never so afraid that I wasn't able to carry out all my responsibilities 100% because I, like everybody else aboard that ship, was determined we were not ever going to let our shipmates down. I think that one thing there kept us on the job, regardless of what the circumstances were. Yeah, that's it, man. When you guys are working together for an overall like completion of a goal, when you guys share the goal, you guys are unstoppable. You know, that's why it's it's a brotherhood. It's a, like, you know, it's it's kind of like, well, no, it's family. You know, you have to pull your weight because you don't want to let the other people down that depend on you. So you you don't want to be the weak link in the team. And so that's that's a massive part of the military in general, in general. Just that's just our 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 mantra, our ethos kind of thing. And it's 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 what gets us through some pretty tough times. Toughness starts at the top. An Enterprise's task force is run by the toughest admiral in the Pacific, William F. Bull Halsey. Halsey's fearless and disciplined. And most importantly, he's a scrapper. Bull Halsey was a man of great personal will, a firm commander, a man that wanted to be in the middle of the action, in the thick of the combat. He was a fighting admiral. I have seen him many times on the bridge when we were under a dive bombing attack, shaking his fist and cussing those Japanese dive bombers. And he was out there He'd have a helmet on, but that was about all. His men immediately respect him. And over the next several months, they will come to love him too. Man. In the fall of 1941, Halsey and the other American commanders have a wary eye on Japan. The Japanese have made several threatening moves in recent years, invading China and allying themselves with Germany and Italy to form the original Axis of Evil. The Empire of the Sun is anxious to expand its territories across Asia. The U.S. and her allies are determined to stop them. Attempts to negotiate with Japan have floundered and American intelligence has intercepted ominous messages hinting at war. By November 27, 1941, talks with Japan have ceased. The following day, Admiral Halsey approves the issuance of a special order. Battle order number one. Bill Norberg, a yeoman or clerk aboard the Enterprise, recall some of the inspiring language from the order. The things that I recall most clearly are the Enterprise is now operating under wartime conditions. Steady nerves and stout hearts are needed. Steady nerves and stout hearts indeed. 
December 6th, 1941. Enterprise is 300 miles from Pearl Harbor. The Big E is due back at Pearl this evening. Lucky for Enterprise and her task force, Mother Nature has other ideas. We ran into a terrific storm. And we fairly well weathered that in the pretty good sized ship that we had. But our little tin can destroyers were bouncing about like bobbles on the water. They used up so much of their fuel that we had to slow down and stop and refuel them. This twist of fortune will actually keep Enterprise and her task force from the far worse fate awaiting the ships docked at Pearl Harbor. Despite the storm, Enterprise still manages to launch 18 scout bomber planes on a routine reconnaissance mission on the morning of December 7th. But this morning will be anything but routine. 200 miles to the east. 353 Japanese warplanes are headed for a date with infamy. Enterprise crewman Sergeant Frank Graves has been temporarily assigned to a post on dry land. He's at machine gun school near the entrance of Pearl Harbor. History is about to happen, and he's got a front row seat. I heard some strange engine sounds. I looked up and right above the algeroba trees, probably not more than 75 feet in the air, were large Japanese three-seater torpedo bombers with a torpedo hanging on, single file, one behind the other. And I started yelling, Japs, Japs. Finally, I guess one guy decided to have some fun and he opened fire on us. Hit the guy next to me. Although Enterprise herself is not in the thick of the battle, Pearl Harbor provides a preview of the fearsome firepower the ship will soon be facing. In addition to their zero fighter planes, the Japanese air arsenal includes the B-5N2 torpedo bomber, nicknamed Kate. With a top speed of 235 miles per hour and a crew of three, the plane doubles as a high-altitude bomber. But the aircraft that will prove to be the most deadly, sinking more Allied warships than any other in the Pacific War, is the D-3A-1 dive bomber, nicknamed Val. With a two-man crew and a max speed of 240 miles per hour, the Val is capable of carrying one 550-pound bomb and two 130-pound bombs. We can see the dive bombers working over Pearl Harbor. Later on, some high-level bombers came in in Pearl Harbor, and I suspect that's the one to get to Arizona. More than 100 miles out to sea, Enterprise receives word that something is happening in the harbor. Something came over the radio. Pearl Harbor under attack. This is no drill. When Admiral Halsey gets the news, he has just finished breakfast and poured his second cup of coffee. Halsey, the men around him, and the Enterprise herself are suddenly electrified. We were pretty much aghast. It just seemed surreal that we could actually be at war right that minute after we'd been at peace just a minute or so before. I think many of us grew up that morning. Man, nothing prepares you for that, man. Just, just be like, oh no, it was just a regular, just regular day, regular day. Before this, last week, no war, you know, carry on business training. And in the next minute, you are thrust into a global conflict. 
I mean, like he said, a lot of people grew up that day. That's understatement. Beyond the horizon to the east, the men of Enterprise's scouting squadron six approach Pearl Harbor and begin to notice that something is very wrong. We could see the smoke billowing up from the island. And I said to the pilot, what the hell is the Army doing holding the Novers on a Sunday for? The true state of affairs is about to become very clear. The squadron's radios crackle with a frantic call from one of the pilots. There was Clarence Dickinson. Now he had a squeaky little voice that <laughs> you couldn't miss him. For sake, shoot that son of a on our tail. He's shooting real bullets. As Dickinson roars into the fight at Pearl, multiple enemy Zero fighters jump in. His rear seat gunner opens fire and downs one of the attackers. But finally, Dickinson's plane succumbs to the barrage of enemy bullets. He didn't die, his gunner was killed, but he parachuted and he made it back and got to fly another plane just right away. Dickinson may have survived, but the first tangle with the enemy has been devastating. Six of the 18 planes Enterprise launched that morning are lost. And for 11 of her airmen, the first battle of the war will also be their last. I couldn't imagine that, man. You get sent out. You get sent out on a routine scouting mission and then you're one of the first like responders to a the first battle of a of of a war like you're not mentally in the zone like that's nuts that's like that's a it's like going to the grocery store and then shit breaks out as like your your mentality is still grocery store like it's not it's not battle it's not that 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 kill tenacity is not there and it's just i couldn't imagine i couldn't imagine like what was going through their heads man just be like oh shit this is real like that oh shit moment that's just it, that is today that's that's that is that day pearl harbor yeah that was that day no one was expecting that at all at, at all man and it's just a a, a the act of god that the Enterprise was out to sea then. USS Enterprise finally steams into its home port on the evening of December 8th, roughly 32 hours after the attack. The ships were on fire. There was smoke everywhere. There was oil all over the water. I don't recall seeing any bodies floating around, thank goodness, but it was a nasty mess. It looked bad. It smelled bad. You could almost feel gloom and doom in the air. They had fire boats and tugs in trying to put out the fires. The surface of Pearl Harbor was about maybe three, four inches deep with fuel oil. Surveying the destruction, Admiral Halsey swears that when he's done, the Japanese language will only be spoken in hell. <laughs> Halsey orders every able body on the ship, officer and enlisted alike, to help refuel and reprovision Enterprise as quickly as possible. It's a job that normally takes a full day of round-the-clock work. On this day, the men get it done in seven hours. USS Enterprise to roll into Pearl Harbor, see all that carnage, for them to do what they need to do, within seven hours, turn right back around and get back out to sea. 
Most people would think that would be pretty amazing. I just think that it just shows the American spirit. That, you know what, okay, you did this to us, watch this. Here we come now. The sneak attack on Pearl has crippled the American Pacific Fleet. Four cruisers, five destroyers, and four auxiliary ships have been damaged or destroyed. None of the fleet's eight battleships have been spared. Four are sunk, and the rest have taken heavy damage. But by striking when none of the seven U.S. aircraft carriers were in port, the Japanese made a critical mistake. And they know it. Starting now, Enterprise and her fellow carriers are at the top of the enemy hit list. Of course, the Japanese wanted them carriers. Because, first of all, they're taking out one of our ships, then they're taking out airplanes, and they're taking out personnel all at the same time. So they're like killing three birds with one stone. They believe if they could have knocked out all of our carriers, that, that they could win us more hands down. We knew that we were an awful big target. Enterprise sails out of Pearl on Tuesday morning into a strange new world, where the threat of death looms just over the horizon. I suspect every one of us probably would have had in our mind, well, why did this have to happen? But now that it has, what are we going to do about it? When we went back to sea on Tuesday morning, for all we knew, we were right into the jaws of the, the Imperial Battle Fleet. So we were a bunch of scared sailors. Understandably, Tensions are high aboard Enterprise and within her task force. Fear of enemy submarines is pervasive. All eyes are open for them. Someone spotted something they thought was a periscope, and of course the destroyer escorts opened fire on it. Dropped a few depth charges around. This thing kept bobbing up periodically. Finally got up close enough to see what it was. Someone had lost a mop overboard somewhere during the line, and this thing was, uh, <laughs> the mop handle kept bouncing up toward the surface. And uh, everyone was a little bit uh, amazed about uh, all of the death charges and ammo. That is awesome. That, uh, that turned out to be the most expensive mop of the whole war. Like, I mean, how much was that in ammo? <laughs> Did we just, uh, you could tell, but you know what? We needed that one out of the way. You need that first one out of the way. Like, what the fuck was that? Rock, yeah. Send it all. Send it all. Oh my God. Wasted on that mob. But the deep waters near Hawaii do conceal legitimate threats. December 10th, 1941. The Big E is on patrol near the Hawaiian Islands. Off to the south of the carrier. Perry Teff, a dauntless dive bomber pilot from Enterprise's Scouting Squadron 6, spots enemy submarines at the surface. Submarines have to come up for air at least once every 24 hours in order to run the diesel engines that recharge their batteries. This morning, Japanese submarine I-70 is in Perry Teff's sights. Time for some revenge. The American pilot swoops in and drops a thousand pound bomb. The explosion rocks the Japanese submarine, damaging it and preventing it from diving beneath the surface. Sometime later, fellow Enterprise scout pilot Clarence Dickinson the man who parachuted from his damaged plane at Pearl Harbor takes another dangerous dive on I-70. Being a dive bomber pilot in World War II takes nerves of steel. Dauntless pilots execute this death-defying maneuver at 275 miles per hour with their canopies open so that they can bail out quickly if they're hit. To ensure the element of surprise, they take their dive at an insanely sharp angle of 70 to 75 degrees. 70 degree dive angle on a 
World War II dive bomber. It's pretty dynamic. It's like your face is pointing at the ground. If I hold you up by your feet, give you just a little bit of push forward, that's 70 degrees. And we don't have to dive at 70 degree angles today because technology has allowed us to do much less dynamic dive angles. Dickinson plunges down toward the sub and finishes the job. Payback. It's the first enemy ship sunk by the U.S. Navy in World War II. Kill belongs to USS Enterprise. For the USS Enterprise to get the first naval kill had to lift the spirits not only of just the ship's crew itself, but all of the American people. To show you know what, we're not done. We're not even close to being done. Enterprise carries on with its patrol duties in the waters near Hawaii until late January 1942. Try as it might, the ship has no luck locating enemy planes and surface vessels near its home islands. The Japanese fleet has long since retired to distant waters. But even without the enemy in attack mode, life aboard ship remains perilous. Every time a plane takes off or lands on the carrier's deck, death is in the air. Landing on an aircraft carrier is always a difficult maneuver. Eventually, with enough experience, you get to the point where you can actually enjoy day landings. Night landings are always not enjoyable. From the time of the very first carriers, the Navy set out to document any aviation mishaps so that when mistakes are made, other pilots on board and across the entire fleet can learn from them. James Barnhill, the ship's bugler, is also a skilled photographer. One of his jobs is to film these death-defying takeoffs and landings. I saw so many that would bounce and go over the side or came into one side of the flat deck or the other and go into the catwalk. If they looked like they were in trouble, then we started the cameras rolling. If it looked like it was a good landing, we didn't bother. The pilots know that if they see the cameramen stand up and start rolling, it means they're probably heading for a rough landing. They would just be sitting up there like vultures waiting to snap pictures of another crash. Back in the day, the pilots would call that area the vulture's nest. And that name is stuck through today. Now you only have a space of landing that is 400 feet long. You, you have six wires out there and you have to land on one of those wires. Of course, you don't want to land on number six. I've only landed on modern aircraft carriers where we have four wires. And I can tell you when you miss the three, and are headed to the fourth, get pretty close to the end of the carry. You always know when you caught a four wire. Now with the six wires that they had back in World War II time frame, I imagine it was pretty similar. You knew when you caught the late wires. But really in pilot terms, we don't care what wire we catch as long as we catch a wire. February 1st, 1942. The days of training and patrolling are over. Guys, I hope, I hope, you enjoy this kind of stuff because man this is just intriguing as hell to me absolutely crazy what these guys went through man time to take the fight to the enemy target wochi island central pacific in the marshall islands chain objective deny the japanese a base for possible invasion of the hawaiian islands Strategy, destroy Japanese airstrips, fuel storage tanks, ammunition dumps, and anti-aircraft batteries.
Enterprise's task force cruiser USS Northampton kicks off the attack. Her 8-inch guns hurl their 260-pound projectiles five miles across the sea to their targets on the island. Closing to within three and a half miles, Northampton can now use her smaller five-inch guns to assault the shore batteries. They were firing shells over the Japanese shore batteries. And instead of hitting the shore batteries with direct hits, the shells were exploding over the shore batteries, and showering those positions with shrapnel. USS Northampton is 600 feet long and 66 feet wide and displaces 9,000 tons. She has a top speed of 32 and a half knots. With nine eight-inch guns, four five-inch rifles, eight 50 caliber machine guns, and six torpedo tubes, she is a force to be reckoned with. The island of Wochi is experiencing that force this morning. Good morning. 100 miles west of Wochi, surveillance has revealed a heavy concentration of enemy vessels at Quadrant Atoll. So while Northampton takes care of Wochi, Enterprise sends its SBD bombers to strike the Kwajalein anchorage. Dusty Cleese speeds south toward an outpost on tiny Kwajalein Island. I found a cruiser there. So no fighters around. Oh boy, this is great. So I got up there and I made this dive. Dive bombing is almost unheard of in modern warfare. Precision-guided bombs that can be deadly accurate from 40,000 feet have made this risky maneuver obsolete. But if you wanted to be sure of hitting your target in World War II, you had to get in close. There's a lot of factors that come into dive bombing. Speed, dive angle, altitude at release, winds aloft. Clearly, the longer you wait to release the bomb, the closer into the target you're going to be, and the less all those factors can influence the bomb's trajectory. So, in that respect, waiting is better. But you also got to be able to pull out of that dive bomb. And you also want to release the munitions so that when it explodes, you're not caught in the frag pattern. So, back then, typically released a uh, bomb between 1,000 and 2,000 feet. Again, the longer you wait, the more accurate it's going to be but also the faster you're going to be pulling out and the lower you're going to be pulling out. So it's kind of a, there's a happy medium in there somewhere. As he dives down toward the Japanese cruiser, Cleese has just one bomb aboard, a 500 pounder. He knew he had one shot, one shot only. Everything had to be perfect. And uh, he did it. I uh, clobbered it. As he pulls out of his dive, Cleese is feeling pressure five to six times the force of gravity. But there's no better feeling than getting right up in the enemy's face and delivering a knockout blow. Five miles to the north, a fellow Enterprise dive bomber pilot has discovered a cluster of merchant ships near the Carlos Pass. He scores a well-timed hit on a tanker scrambling toward the channel's mouth. Oh my God, it's so great. It was trying to go out at sea, and he hit it right on the head and caught it on fire. The tanker just happens to be at the choke point of the channel, and it blocks passage by the remaining ships. Well, here were all these ships inside of the lagoon. Then the USS Enterprise launched nine torpedo planes after it to go get those remaining ships that were caught inside of the channel. Practically no anti-aircraft gun, and here these things couldn't move. Well, it was like shooting fish in the barrel. The torpedo bombers sent by Enterprise are Douglas TBD Devastators. 
slow, antiquated aircraft that will soon be replaced by more agile planes. With a sluggish maximum speed of 207 miles per hour and a feeble rate of climb of just 720 feet per minute, TBDs are overly vulnerable to both enemy fighters and anti-aircraft fire. They carry a single 2,200-pound Mark 13 torpedo. The Enterprise TBDs pass over Kwajalein Lagoon and drop their payloads, but there's not a single explosion. At this point in the war, American torpedo technology is hit or miss, and it's mostly miss. Nine out of every 10 torpedoes veers off course or fails to detonate. It's a frustrating reality for the pilots risking their lives at Kwajalein. Monster torpedoes, not one hit. Luckily, there are American bombers in the area too, and their explosives are working just fine. Kwajalein Harbor is a smoking, burning wreck by the time Admiral Halsey calls off the attack. Some 90 enemy personnel are killed at Kwajalein, including the area commander. The Marshall Islands raids are a huge success, and Enterprise returns to a hero's welcome at Pearl Harbor. We were standing out there and cheering. I remember nurses waving uh, towels. I remember some of the army people holding, holding their rifles up. And I even remember one guy holding a mop and he was shaking that back and forth. They were so elated that somebody had whacked the enemy good and proper. And of course our sailors were manning the flight deck by the hundreds. And they were looking pretty spiffy up there. And as we passed the Nevada, those guys hollered out in unison, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. And our people responded, just unbelievably exhilarating, hip, hip, hooray, hip, hip, hooray. And it sounds kind of soft mark at a time like this when you look back on it, but at that time, it's just exactly what we needed. The sailors and airmen of Enterprise. Super important. Super important. The rebuttal needed to be that swift and that and that that deadly. And they needed to come away with a win. Like that set the pace for the the war in the Pacific. You know, it needed to have a rebuttal, an immediate response. You know, and that's something that it just I feel like that was everything. It'd be a whole different story if, one, if the Japanese sunk our aircraft carriers that, thank God, weren't even in the harbor. And then, two, at least they found something super fast and retaliated with overwhelming odds. And they, they did a, a very, very good job of coming back home with their heads held high will soon get yet another small taste of sweet revenge. Mid-April, 1942. Sailors on the deck of USS Enterprise notice that the air is getting chillier. They've been operating in the steamy South Seas for weeks, and now the brisk weather is making it very obvious that they're sailing north. But only the Admiral seems to know why. Tension aboard Enterprise is still high. At any moment, the calming sounds of the sea could be interrupted by the whine of a Japanese Zero or a torpedo broadsiding the ship. Up on the bridge, Captain's yeoman Bill Norberg is working an all-nighter. I was working my shift on the bridge at night. And it was a 12 to 4 o'clock in the morning shift. 
and I was out on the port wing of the bridge. And out there, it just so happened, the general quarters buzzer is out there. And I kind of nodded off, and my head was leaning back, and it hit that buzzer. And the thing went off. And of course, that means everybody jump out of your sacks, get your clothes on, get to your battle stations. Around the ship, the crew jumps into action. Men roll out of bunks and grab for helmets. Crews ready their guns. But the skies remain quiet. Soon word spreads that this is a false alarm, and everyone aboard ship wants to know who triggered it. And I heard somebody say, I don't know who it was, but he had a pea coat on, and that was me. And I took off, and nobody caught me, thank goodness, because, you know, sleeping on duty isn't the best thing you can do in a time of war. (laughs) At roughly 6 a.m. on the morning of April 12th, the men of the Big E and her task force notice a completely unexpected sight in the distance. I walked out from the comm shack on the walkway, and I looked over there, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The surprise vessel is friendly. It's their sister carrier, USS Hornet, but she's carrying mysterious cargo. There was something wrong with Hornet's silhouette. What was wrong with it is the flight deck was half covered with these big, strange-looking airplanes that were not painted navy colors, and they weren't naval aircraft. And they finally figured out they were B-25s, and they had army camouflage painted on them. The army B-25s are here to make a bombing run on the heart of Japan. Target, Tokyo, and other industrial centers around Japan. Objective, take out factories and munitions plants and demoralize the enemy by assaulting her homeland. Strategy, attack with 16 B-25 bombers launched from USS Hornet. I don't like to use the word revenge, but sure. I mean, there there was some revenge uh, that that they wanted to get some back. You know, they were mad. And they weren't stand for it then, and we don't stand for it now. You know, you reach out and you hurt us, we're coming after you. And you know what? There ain't a damn thing you can do about it. So they're just out there in the middle of the ocean. Like, what the, what the hell is that? Oh, my God. It's one of us. No communication. Nothing. Like, I feel like nowadays that's impossible to happen, obviously, because of the ca- uh, carrier strike group. I think that's what it's called. Right? Um, and I, the only reason I know that terminology is because we checked out a video from the fat electrician over on Embrace the Stuck 21. So, like... Like now it's just all radar. Everyone knows everyone moves, but back then that must have been crazy. But like, what the hell is that? It's one of us. Shit, what do they have? Oh, <laughs> hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, that's awesome. Army Air Corps Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle has agreed to lead the daring mission, and he's chosen the B-25 as the aircraft on which to trust his life. North American Mitchell B-25B is a twin-engine medium bomber with a range, depending on bomb load, of about 1,300 miles. It's typically manned by a crew of five and can deliver up to 5,000 pounds of bombs. While other bombers have more range and power, the B-25's modest wingspan of 67 feet 7 inches will allow USS Hornet to fit more bombers on its flight deck. The plan is for the carrier to get Doolittle's bombers within striking distance of Japan. They will then launch, bomb Tokyo and their other targets, and continue on to land in friendly remote Chinese territory. Since Hornet's normal defensive aircraft must be stored below deck to make room for the Mitchells, Enterprise and her task force will go along to protect the Hornet if she is attacked. We were all thrilled, but we were scared to death. We said. This is a suicide mission. In order to ensure that Doolittle's bombers have enough fuel to reach the designated landing area in China, 
Hornet and Enterprise need to get the planes within 400 miles of the Japanese mainland. But bad luck intervenes. We ran across this little, what we thought was a fishing boat. Turned out to be a patrol boat. We didn't pick it up on our surface radar, it was that small. Cruiser Nashville went out with her six inch battery and sank this thing. And we thought, well, maybe we got away with it. But Radio Pearl Harbor actually intercepted a message reporting warships. So they had to launch, and they had to launch right then and there. There was no turning back. The carriers are 650 miles from the Japanese mainland. It means Doolittle and his men might not have the fuel to make it out safely. They choose to go anyway. At 8.20 a.m., on the cold, damp, and blustery morning of April 18, 1942, the B-25 Mitchell bombers prepare for takeoff. High wind, high seas, carrier racing 30 knots, pitching and bucking like a bronco, about 25 knots headwind. Wind on the flight deck of the carrier is 55 knots. The pilots have more to worry about than the weather. Carriers like Enterprise and Hornet weren't designed to launch planes this heavy. And this is the first time a B-25 has attempted to take off from a carrier in combat. Now, that aircraft wasn't designed to be taken off of an aircraft carrier, so they really had to get as much wind over the deck as possible because wind over the deck translates to flying speed off the angle. Once the bombers are speeding down the flight deck, there's only two places they can end up. With enough speed, They'll be in the sky, too slow, and they'll be in the sea. Taking off in a high wind, high sea environment is always tricky. Your number one priority right there is gonna be making sure that the aircraft is lifting off the end of the deck when the bow is high. Making it even more difficult, the bombers have been stripped of all non-essential items to make room for more fuel and bombs. They're even heavier than usual. Colonel Doolittle himself is the first to go. And you got all these aircraft stacked up on the flight deck, so uh, the first guys to take off have the least amount of runway. Doolittle's bomber struggles off the deck, but manages to stay airborne. Oh my God, it's crazy. And the second one to go off almost dipped into the water. And if I recall, there was one more plane that almost went in the drink. But all 16 of them got on their way. Four hours after launch, the bombers finally reach their targets. Despite enemy flak, each plane drops 2,000 pounds of hell into the heart of the Japanese homeland. They then turn toward the Chinese coast and their designated landing area. But as the last drops of fuel funnel from the bomber's tanks, most of Doolittle's air crews have no choice but to bail out or crash land. Three crewmen perish in the process. Eight are captured by the Japanese. The physical damage done to Japan has been negligible. The psychological impact is truly significant on both sides of the Pacific. It was definitely a morale booster, not only for our servicemen, but for our whole country. At a time of war, when the enemy is getting nailed at the heart of their homeland, it makes you feel like, you know what? You try to stop us, it ain't happening. We're coming after you. It showed the Japanese that they weren't invincible that we could reach out and we could touch it. The first six months of the war have been a trial by fire for the crew of the Enterprise. 
In December of 1941, the men of the Big E were sailing the Pacific, unsure of what lay beyond the horizon. Now, they are well on their way to becoming a battle-tested fighting machine. Morale on board runs high. We didn't look for the war to last very long. We just didn't think that the Japanese were that strong. They thought that the war would be over relatively quick, and they couldn't have been more wrong. Just beginning. Soon, the pilots and gunners from the Enterprise Task Force will come face to face with the enemy again. The course of the war will change forever in the massive and deadly Battle of Midway. Awesome, man. All right, so check this out, guys. After six grueling months of war, USS Enterprise had proven her steel. This is episode three. We need, we're going to get to ap episode two after this. If you guys are there for it, man, come on. Oh, my God. I love this stuff. I love this stuff. Come on. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I know that it was long, but, hey, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, hopefully, you guys are just kind of brushing up on what you guys already know. And I'm I, I'm loving this. This is, this is everything to me. Like, this strategy, the the like they they tap into a little bit of the the psychology behind the why and i'm i'm there for it guys let me know let me know if you want me to continue with this series please let me know i really hope and pray this goes up on youtube i hope so um but anyway guys much love thank you for rocking with the channel make sure you unplug do something legendary and honestly please like and share this we are a very young very small channel so any traction, we need all the traction right now that we can get to, to push these these videos out there into that dreaded algorithm. So you guys are legends, first and foremost. Just unplug, do something legendary, and I will see you in the next video. I can't wait. I'll premiere this. Guys, this is a premiere. I'll be in the, in the uh, live chat if it does go up on YouTube. If not... You're seeing this on Rumble, and you guys are legends anyway. All right, later, guys. <laughs>